back with macromolecules. We've got one left to do, and that is proteins. Now, proteins are multi-purpose molecules. They're found all throughout our body. Actually, 50% of all dry cell mass or weight is made up of proteins. So, and proteins have a lot of different functions, a lot of different structures, and remember that their structure determines their function. Um, when we talk about proteins, we have to talk about amino acids. Amino acids are the monomer of proteins. So these are the building blocks of proteins. And these amino acids are broken up into four different parts. They have the central part here, which is in the middle. All of them will be exactly the same. They have the amine group, which is the NH2 group, will be on one end. The carboxyl group, which is the COOH group on the other. And the R group, which is the variable group. Every amino acid that you see will have the first three will be identical. Now, the fourth one will be the variable group, and that's what changes amino acid from different ones or it makes them different. Now, there are 20 different amino acids, okay? Now, proteins, depending on what amino acids they have, they're going to be in different ways. And there are a wide variety of proteins, and I've just listed some down here for you. Basically, function of proteins, they're involved in almost everything in our body. Enzymes are proteins. There are proteins that are involved with structure, so far as in your skin, keratin, collagen. Um, there are carriers for transport, hemoglobin in your blood, which carries... Um, oxygen and carbon dioxide, aquapurines, which cause the transport moving back and forth across the plasma membrane. They're involved in cell in, smell communication by being your signalers or by being receptors. They're involved in the defense of your body by being antibodies. They're involved in movement by doing the active myosin, which is the fibers of your muscles. Storage, you know, they can even be like in beans, seeds have proteins that act as storage for the seed to be able to grow. So proteins have a wide variety of functions that they do. I mean, just about everything you can think of. But the very key thing you need to remember is that their structure is always related to their function. Now, when we talk about the proteins, then there's 20 amino acids, depending on how you arrange them, is what makes up proteins. And if you look up here in the right corner, it's kind of talking about something we did yesterday. If you have an amino acid here, and you want to join that to this amino acid here, then you're going to have to take out a water. So the amine of one group, which is here, the amino group of one, will attach to the carboxyl group of another amino acid. And they always grow in this fashion. All right, and it creates what we call a peptide chain or a peptide bond will be created right here. Now, do you remember what it's called when water leaves and when two molecules come together? I hope you remember that this is a dehydration synthesis that causes this to come together. Okay, protein structure and function. I've been saying that the structure of the protein is related to its function. Proteins are 3D structures. That means they're folded within themselves. They don't go in a single line necessarily or a double helix shape. They're folded all amongst themselves. Uh, and this twisting, folding, cooling gives each protein a unique shape. Now, protein shape can be changed by a process called denaturing. Now, the easiest way to denature something is heat it up. That's going to cause it to unravel. Or change the pH or salinity is going to cause the hydrogen bonds to break, ionic bonds to break. It's going to cause it to unravel. So whenever a protein unravels, its structure changes, therefore it's no, able to, no longer able to do the function that it would do. So if you denature a protein, you make it where it no longer works. All right, so think of that. We just we did a lab not too long ago with chicken livers and hydrogen peroxide. Chicken livers had enzymes in them, which are proteins, and if we heated that, in, that liver up, we cooked it, it no longer reacted with hydrogen peroxide. That's because the protein or that is the enzyme inside the liver, became denatured. Okay, so that destroys functionality whenever you unravel it. Now, the next little thing is kind of hard to understand for students a lot of times, so, so bear with me. Um, the levels of protein structure are four, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Um, now, they, we're going to go through each one, and they kind of build on each other. They start out as primary, secondary involves primary, tertiary involves secondary and primary on up. They kind of go like building blocks. So let's go to primary first. Primary is just a simple list. It's like an alphabet. 
uh, of amino acids. If you look over here on the right hand side, it's just a straight chain where you have an amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, amino acid. It goes on a long chain. All right, that's primary structure. Now, this is not actually a functioning protein yet, but this is the far, first step of it. All right. Next is secondary. When you have these chains and they start to have local folding, you start to have hydrogen bonds forming, and they start connecting to each other. So here you have chains talking to each other by these hydrogen bonds. And you have two types. You can have alpha helix, which is here, which is kind of like a double helix, kind of like a spiral, okay? Kind of like a spirally form. And then you have a beta, which is a pleated sheet, which is a flat um, accordion type structure. But the main thing is that they fold within themselves and they're linked together by hydrogen bonds. Tertiary, you get the whole mo molecule starts forming. You have it bending back on itself. You have all types of bonds. You have ionic bond where different amino groups are losing electrons in order to uh, bind with one another positively and negatively attract. Covalent, they share electrons. Uh, Van der Waals force these weak forces of attraction. Disulfide sulfide bridges where, where um, two sulfurs connect. Um, I've already mentioned the hydrogen bonding. I think ionic bonding, positive and negative. So you have the whole structure start to fold within itself. You even can have hydrophobic interactions, which uh, if one thing is hydrophobic, scared of water, it actually fold back within itself so the other structures will keep it away from the water. So it's kind of a, a very complex. And then the last one you have quaternary or uh, structure, which is the actual functioning protein. And this is when those polypeptide chains you made in the, the tertiary structures start to fold amongst themselves. For example, down here in the bottom corner, this example I've given you, there are four, uh, four, four polypeptides, one, two, three, four, that have folded amongst themselves, and they make this hemoglobin. So it's very complex, but if it's going to real, real quickly, you know, the amino acid sequence is like your primary structure, which is down here in this corner, right? The sequence here is your primary structure. Your secondary structure is when the R groups start to talk to one another and start communicating, and they are connected by hydrogen bonds. The tertiary structure, which is here, is when those R groups start to forming more complex interactions, and the polypeptide chains start forming either a pleated sheet or this alpha helix structure. And then you have the last one, the quaternary structure, is whenever you have folding of everything, and that's when you actually get the functioning protein. So I hope this has helped you a little bit with understanding proteins, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.